Oh, hey, Chris. Oh, hey, how's it going? Good, how are you? Good, good. Uh, you know, so today's podcast seems to be a little different. It seems a lot different. We, uh, we don't usually have technical difficulties, but we had some this morning. Well, you know, that's what happens when you try something really cool and new like Facebook Live. We are always trying something cool and new, aren't we? So are you, uh, are you at home right now? Are you in the office? What's your deal? I am hiding out in my office at the hospital and social distancing. I barely see other humans, so I'm in a good, safe spot. What about you? I am hiding out in my own home, uh, hiding from my children who will inevitably try to break into this room at some point, like they did earlier this week when I was giving a lecture on Zoom. Uh, so I feel a bit weird. I have a dining chair um, tucked up against the door, so I have at least a couple of seconds of warning before they barricade in here. So. Yeah, whatever, whatever it takes. That's our motto, right? Yeah, so let's, uh, well, we're going to be fielding some questions maybe from Facebook Live as they come in and people are seeing uh, what this podcast looks like. So you do all the technical stuff. Uh, we've got our special microphones. I've got mine here that you made me buy. It's fantastic. Yeah, I saw some comments about that on Twitter. People were complimenting on the size of your microphone. That was awesome. Yeah, you know, they, they think that I'm a rapper from the 90s. <laughs> Always so should we explain what we're doing with our podcast and how it came to be on Facebook Live, maybe? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, you know, so our marketing group for the department uh, is excellent, and they've put in a lot of work into, uh, into social media, and they provided us with the opportunity to, uh, to put our podcast live and see if it'll generate any questions, uh, discussion, and we can incorporate that as we go along. Yeah, it's great. Our podcast is... I don't know where it's really targeted. It's probably targeted a little bit towards the professional audience, but we're going to try to mix uh, this one so that we're providing useful information potentially to other physicians and surgeons, but also uh, address some patient concerns and explain really how you and I see the world as far as being physicians and how we interact with patients. Yeah, so we wanted to talk about a topic that's very, uh, um, very hot right now in the world of hand surgery and just you know, medicine in general, and that's um, shared decision making. Um, and I think probably best in the context of one of the most common conditions that we see, um, which is arthritis at the base of the thumb. Yeah, I think that that's right. And the, I guess prior to talking about shared decision-making, the lingo around this, and I guess it still is, you just don't hear it talked about much, is patient-centered care. So, mm -hmm. uh, you know, in the older days, and I would say that as I started practicing, I was in the older days, um, you know, the doctor made the decisions and told the patient, this is what we're going to do. And uh, I don't know if it was that cut and dry, um, but if, it, it, to some degree, the doctor had a paternalistic relationship with the patients and they said, uh, patients typically said, okay, and that's how it was. Is that your understanding? Yeah, that's my understanding. And then you'll still, I, I mean, you know, I'm pretty young. Uh, well, I like to think I'm still young. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, what are you implying about me as you say that? <laughs> but, you know, I, I still, you know, I think I see it in certain generations of patients uh, where they just want you to make the decision for them. Um, they, they trust that you are going to make the right decision. Um, but we all know that there are tons of factors that go into a decision for what type of uh, treatment you provide. And then as the doctor, to be honest, we can steer them whichever way that we think is appropriate. Um, and some patients I, um, are very much into this thought of being engaged in their care and and um, have questions and want to understand options and alternatives and what is best for them, but some don't. Yeah, I think that's right. I, I would say, you know, I grew up in the South and I, we live in the Midwest. Um, you spent some time in New York City. And I think there's a cultural difference, perhaps you may, uh, may agree, yeah. Yeah. about what patients want as a generalization. Yeah, I think coastal patients are different, um, for better or worse. Um, it's definitely a different interaction. You know, I never spent time as a practicing surgeon in New York City, but, you know, seeing enough office interactions as residents um, definitely let me know what that was like. Um, and, you know, for better or worse, it is what it is. I, I'm happy, uh, you know, one of the reasons why I love practicing where we practice is that um, I think that it's honestly easier and very fulfilling. Um, but I, I do think it's really important to incorporate the patient-centered aspects into it. Because um, you know, I think about what I would want as a patient, I would want to understand my options. I don't know how much I'd want to go through um, you know, everything. I still trust that the physician that I'm seeing is going to help me get to the right decision. But I think there's some behavioral psychology there. I mean, you feel better about a decision that you have been invested in, and you're going to have less regret about it. 
Right, for sure. And it also gets to the point, we want, Chris and I have the same philosophy, we want patients engaged uh, and we want a family member engaged because we know study after study has shown that patients don't remember um, a lot about their doctor visit. And, uh, you know, we think everything goes perfectly and the plan was clearly laid out, but it's helpful, again, to have that engagement and also have a friend or family member in the room. And so we like that. Of course, that's pre-COVID-19, but, but we do like that concept of engaging as many people as possible and helping to come to a group decision. Yeah, I mean, especially for things that are um, elective, discretionary, preference sensitive, whatever term you want to use, where it's not a trauma, it's not an emergency, um, where there is some wiggle room for different treatment options and timing. Um, I, I think a, a patient who comes to that decision feeling like they had the appropriate amount of input into it um, and that they have a good relationship and good communication with their doctor is going to feel better. And ultimately, you know, it's hard to prove this. They're probably going to have a better outcome in terms of their own satisfaction. I think that's right. And there are some suggestions in the literature of that being true. So should we, um, should we really get into it and talk about a diagnosis and explain how this might work? Um, and the diagnosis we've chosen is arthritis at the base of the thumb. So the, the so-called CMC arthritis, um, which is a super common diagnosis. We see it regularly. It's interesting for us because patients can have terrible arthritis and minimal pain. They can have mild arthritis by x-ray and terrible pain. And so there's so many factors that go into trying to figure out the best treatment for each patient. Yeah, and you know, I think to, uh, for completeness sake, the, the type of symptoms that patients typically have is you know, pain in the area where, uh, where Chuck and, you know, was mentioning right there, uh, but it's, it's a hard time with opening jars. Um, and that seems to be the biggest issue. It's not carpal tunnel syndrome, although sometimes those two can come together. It's not numbness and tingling in the fingers, but it's just, I can't open a jar. Um, I have a hard time when I'm trying to, um, to pinch things um, because it just hurts so bad at the bottom of the thumb. Yeah, and we don't talk about this much in hand surgery, but the opposable thumb is pretty important, apparently. It differentiates us from some of our ancestral, uh, you know, evolutionary... Yeah, um, the hand surgeon nerdy humor there. <laughs> that's right. Well, you got to get some of that in. Thank you. Um, yeah, so we want that thumb to be fully mobile and opposable. And so, you know, it's interesting, like everything in medicine, we get attached to what has worked for us and for our patients, even if that is not necessarily the best, quote unquote, best treatment in the literature. And so different people have different opinions. Um, and so even if we try to engage every patient in such a decision, you know, there's still a discussion to be had. And, you know, there's enough disagreement about what the quote best treatment is, um, because it really depends on where you, who you trade with and your own experience. And I've noticed a shift in some of the papers that have been submitted and published recently, you know, trying to say, look, you know, surgery, you know, there are a lot of things that you can do before surgery, including splinting and injections, um, and then surgery itself. But some of those treatments aren't actually going to change this disease process. You know, what is the use of doing some of these things? Uh, maybe you should just be working on learning how to live with your arthritis and adjust to it. Um, and, and I've seen sort of a pushback to some of the philosophies that we typically have espoused in terms of, you know, do the injection, do the splinting. Once you fail two or three injections and you go to surgery. Um, have you noticed a shift in philosophies at all recently? I've noticed a shift in philosophies, but I haven't, <laughs> maybe I'm blind. I haven't noticed a shift in patient preferences. Yeah. You know, if a patient makes a choice to come to see you or me they're coming for a reason. Some people want information and that may be sufficient for them, but most people want something offered to help make them feel better or else they wouldn't have come to see us. So say, say somebody comes in to see you um, and they've got pain at the base of the thumb. It's pretty apparent based on their complaints and their examination with or without an x-ray that they have arthritis at, the, at the, uh, the thumb CMC joint or the basal joint. Most common place in the hand to get arthritis. What's your initial discussion with that patient about options? They haven't tried any braces yet. They've maybe tried occasional Advil or you know, ibuprofen to leave or something like that. Yeah, well, first I try to discuss my perceptions of what arthritis, uh, the implications of having arthritis. And so that often is cyclical pain. You know, there's times when it's better, there's times when it's worse. And our goal initially is to try to get them through those times where they're having a lot of pain and uh, with and then you know, allow them to have longer periods of, of no pain. And so for me, it starts with a discussion of that, what's the meaning of having the arthritis. And usually I start with therapy. 
And so therapy, anti-inflammatories, and when I tell people to take an anti-inflammatory like Motrin or Advil, I say take it for a week. You know, take it on a regularly scheduled basis for at least a week, send them to therapy for a brace, have therapy work with them on uh, motion and on strengthening of you know, the musculature around the joint and see what happens. There's pretty good science that says therapy and splinting and exercises work. Is that similar to your approach or how do you think about it? Yeah, you know, I, um, I think about, you know, the options that we have, you know, the anti-inflammatories, um, the injections, those are not going to cure the arthritis, so to say. Um, and they may not help be a, a viable long-term solution for a lot of patients. And if the goal is to really get patients to be able to tolerate these symptoms and find ways to move past them, then I think therapy really has value there um, because of the, you know, the strengthening exercises, uh, joint mobilization, all that kind of stuff will help them figure out ways to use their hand in a manner that's not going to flare up their arthritis. Um, and, and I think honestly, that is the best chance we have shy of surgery of actually making a difference and getting their symptoms better. Um, so how long do you um, typically treat patients with those kinds of things like therapy and bracing and anti-inflammatories? The longer the better. And this, again, it goes back to how much, how much a patient's willing to invest in that concept and it's so patient dependent. Some of them will not have much patience, but many of them do. You know, my line is, um, if you're thinking about a brace, and we use, the reason I send people to therapy for a brace is we can make really low profile brace. The braces, the wrist is uh, free to move and the therapists who get it, and thankfully the therapists we work with get it, make a low profile brace, which immobilizes that joint. And even in that situation, the perfect brace, it's not easy or fun to wear. And so I tell people that, you know, wear the brace when your arthritis is really bothersome, take it off as much as you can and give it 12 weeks, give it enough time to really give it a chance. And if you aren't getting over the hump, if you still can't open the jars and do what you want to do, come back because we have other options. So what, what, um, that's your normal conversation with a patient. How do you feel like something like a decision aid may actually help? And, you know, so what a decision aid is, is a, some, some kind of, uh, process, whether it's a video or a web-based thing where you go on the internet and say, these are my symptoms and, you know, here are my options and learn about them. It's a, um, it's a tool that helps patients understand what their options are um, and not just, you know, get steered by one doctor or therapist that you're seeing. Do you think there's a role for something like that in, in addition to how you already talk to patients? Yeah, you know, as confident as I am in my ability to convey information and, and work on this back and forth process, um, a proven uh, test or device or decision aid, whatever you want to call it, that adds to that, I think is useful. Again, it depends on the patients and some of them don't want to do that. But for the patient that really wants to engage, there certainly is no harm and there's likely a benefit to it. It's funny because I've had more time in clinic during this coronavirus to really spend time with patients, whether it's telehealth visits or in-person visits, it's almost like we're practicing a different kind of medicine, which is super enjoyable because we're not rushing from room to room and we feel that serious time pressure on us in normal times and this has been enjoyable. Um, so if I don't have enough time, sometimes using something like a decision aid will help the patient better understand their options. I think that's what you're getting at. Yeah, and you know, I think that, you know, I don't wanna, you know, I don't wanna just um, outsource uh, a conversation to a video or to something on the internet. I don't think most patients would take that well. I think that if you are able to present the information in as objective of a way as possible and then um, refer them to, to a decision aid or something else to reinforce it, I think that's great. Um, and I agree with you, we've had more time. You know, we, we put a lot of resource into telemedicine and I think that patients have enjoyed that. Um, and I think that's one of the silver linings out of all of this is that the way that we teach um, and the way that we see patients is going to evolve for the better, as an aside. Um, you know, but I think that patients come to you because they want your opinion. Um, they want to know what Dr. Goldfarb um, recommends, and a decision aid isn't going to quite get you there. Yeah, totally agree. I, I, I like your aside. You know, telehealth is here to stay, and for patients listening, uh, give it a try. It's, it's weird. It's different. It's, I promise it's weird and different from our side as well, because we're trying to understand a patient's complaints and we lack the ability to put our hands on you and uh, assess. Um, but it's great. Like I've been really pleased with that option. And I agree with you though, no matter what other assistive 
devices and questionnaires and computer programs exist, I hope that patients come to me wanting my opinion. And I think that's true. And I hope that I can instill confidence in them to you know, help them make the right decision for themselves. And that's the way I look at it. Help a patient make the right decision for themselves. I don't want to impose a decision on a patient. Yeah, and I think that, you know, um, we don't want to impose decisions, but clearly we know that there are some, um, some people out there that will say, okay, you need this. This is what you're getting because you're seeing me. Um, and I, I think that we don't want to appear heavy handed, um, but we don't want to shift the pendulum too much where we let patients make every decision for themselves. Um, we like, I think an informed patient will do the best in terms of outcome. Um, so what do you think patients uh, should do to prepare themselves for a visit? Um, say this patient, the theoretical patient we were talking about earlier comes in and has, you know, complaints and they've come back and they've tried the splinting. Um, they've tried the anti-inflammatory, it's just not cutting it. Um, how do you think they should prepare for that visit with you in terms of how they should you know, maybe uh, think about questions to ask or things like that? It's always amusing to me because patients inevitably apologize for having gone on the web. And we know, first of all, it's no secret. Most patients go on the web and get information. And I think that's good. I mean, yes, occasionally I have to work to um, share that that's not an accurate piece of information when a patient repeats something back to me, but generally information is good. So the more a patient has learned, the better. And then I always share my algorithm, which is start with therapy, start with anti-inflammatories. And the next step in my algorithm is a steroid injection, a cortisone injection. And why is the next step? Because it works. You know, it's a very effective treatment. Most people get better, but the reality is we don't know for how long. It can be three months of relief. It can be more than a year of relief, but patients get better. Yeah, and I think to push back on that a little bit, you know, some people would say, well, you're not changing the actual underlying disease condition. But you know what? If it buys you six months, uh, nine months, a year, or even a couple of months uh, before you have to have surgery, uh, then why not? Yeah, you know, this steroid, it's interesting. This, I, in my mind, and for listeners or watchers, uh, this steroid injection is kind of like a knee injection um, where you're giving an injection for pain relief and to allow a patient to function better. Whereas other steroid injections that you and I give all the time for tendonitis or for a trigger finger, we give those with the hope of a cure. We know this is just a temporary improvement, but it's amazing how many patients come back on a regular basis asking for uh, additional injections. So maybe something that's of interest to our hand surgeon listeners, hand therapist listeners, as well as patients. How do you advise um, patients about what, to, what they'll experience right after the injection, the so-called flare? Right. And the number, so I, this has been an issue of mine for a long time because it's very frustrating. I, I warn patients there's two negatives to an injection. One, it hurts a little bit to get an injection, but honestly, this is not a terribly painful injection. But the second issue is worse. And that is the flare reaction, which I quote about one out of 10 patients will get a flare reaction. It's a reaction to the steroid injection, not to something they did or something that I did. It's just a reaction to the medication. Um, if it happens, it typically happens the next day. And they will not be happy with me for 24 hours. And I know that firsthand because Talia had an injection and was really not happy with me for a long time, more than a day. But for most patients, it's just a day. And- um, Not you're in the basement right now. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, so that, that's the warning. And that even that little bit of information is super helpful because if you don't mention it and a patient has a flare, they're really unhappy. Yeah, you know, I, I like to quote the study that you and Ryan uh, worked on, um, on, you know, the instance of flare reactions when I'm talking to trainees. But when I talk to patients, I tell everyone they're going to have a flare reaction. And maybe that's just a, you know, framing heuristic or whatever. But, you know, I'd rather them think that this is going to happen um, rather than be a little bit caught off guard. Um, and I, I tell them, you know, and I think it's a, I've got the handout from your practice, but to put ice on it, to take whatever you would normally take for a headache. I expect it to happen within the first 24 hours. Um, and I tell them the same thing you say, you're not going to like me. You are going to hate me at this time when the flare reaction comes. And then it typically subsides uh, by, you know, about 24 hours after the injection has been given. But that first night can be really rough. Um, and I usually tell them that the steroid injection takes about three or four days to kick in in most people, the steroid component of that injection. Um, but it, I've seen it take up to a week to kick in, although I don't think that's the norm. Um, what are you injecting? Um, 
I inject Depomedrol um, with a little bit of local anesthetic. So I'll use a little bit of lidocaine and I play with different types of injections. And for me, this seems to work as well as any. I don't think it matters all that much, to be honest. How much do you think you can inject before it starts to become a painful injection at time zero? Yeah, and that's one of the things that I believe can contribute to a flare. If you have a joint of fixed capacity and say for this joint it's one cc, and it depends on how much arthritis you have and all that, and I try to jam in 1.5 cc's, it's too much and it really expands that capsule of the joint. I think that's one of the factors probably that leads to a flare. So I, I inject until I feel that resistance and then ideally I'll let a little bit of the fluid back out. That's my approach. What's yours? Same. And, you know, for the, um, for the trainees that are listening in, um, you will feel that kind of, uh, that pushback that Chuck described. Um, so, and just stop. Like, it, there's no point in continuing. It will just make people unhappy. That extra little bit of steroid you think you're getting in there will make no difference. It will just leak out and dissipate. So. Yeah. One more question before we shift gears and talk about surgical options. So do you have confidence that you can give an injection each time into the joint? How much confidence do you have? I have confidence in it. Um, I feel that I probably would be more accurate if I use fluoro every time, but I don't feel the need to subject patients to extra radiation because I feel like I can get into the joint every time. If I, especially if I, you know, the way that I do it um, and I've learned from you guys is I pull some traction with my other hand. I flex the metacarpal head down a little bit. So pulling traction, flexing down. And oftentimes I will have patients kind of help me with that if I want them to be involved. And that helps me get into the joint. And once you feel that kind of base, the, the thumb metacarpal tipping up, if you angle your needle correctly, you will feel yourself pop into the joints. And then as the more surgeries that I've done, the more uh, I've had an appreciation for the, uh, the geometry of that thumb metacarpal base and where I can get in. Um, and then I have to feel a pop. And as I'm, you know, using my, um, uh, my thumb is on the, uh, the plunger of the, uh, of the syringe and I'm starting to feel kind of where I get a give. And I know that I'm in. Um, you know, from a literature perspective, I know that Bob Hotchkiss uh, at HSS was part of, um, they were doing a hyaluronase acid injection study. And a reviewer pushed back on that study saying, well, how do you know you're in the joint? And so he injected 100 joints and <laughs> showed that he was in every time. And that's a very, um, if you know Bob, that's kind of, you know, his shtick. Um, why would you question this for me? But um, I, I think most hand surgeons are going to be able to get in that joint reliably. Um, I know, I, but I know, you know some of our partners use fluoro for guidance. What are your thoughts? Yeah, I think that's exactly right. And I, I feel comfortable and confident in my ability to get in the joint. And it's not always as easy as putting the needle right in the joint the first time, yeah. um, meaning you may have to inject a little bit just to make the soft tissues a little less uncomfortable. But you know, I'll feel pretty comfortable with it. So how do you think about surgical options for patients? So let's say the same patient comes back, they've had two injections with wonderful relief, which to me means, yeah, we have the diagnosis right. If you get that relief, the diagnosis is correct. And if we choose a surgery, we feel pretty comfortable that whatever surgery we choose can help. I think about surgery in different ways. So how do you conceive of the big picture surgical options? Well, first off, I tell them that, unfortunately, unlike hip and knees and shoulders, we don't have an option for replacement. People think that they can get a metal on plastic kind of joint replacement in that area. And while there are options, if patients were to look on the internet, um, and we talked about this in one of the recent episodes, you know, implant options here have a substantially and significantly higher complication rate. Um, and we have better options uh, that aren't as, quote, fancy. Um, but they certainly do the job. And, you know, this is one of those things where at this point, I probably have gotten an x-ray. I don't use x-ray or fluoroscopy much early on, but if we're heading to surgery, it's a useful tool for me to say, look, here are the areas where you have arthritis, assuming there's some kind of joint space narrowing at that point or advanced findings. And I say, I pointed out, say, here's where you have arthritis. Here are the two bones that are rubbing on each other, causing pain. One of the treatments that is tried and true is to take that bone out. Um, and I'm talking about the trapezium for the patients. Um, and then I say there's a lot of, um, there are a lot of ways to keep the, th um, the thumb metacarpal from pushing down on the rest of the other bones in the wrist. Um, we used to do it this way, and that's a really, really good option. And then the other option, and that's what I usually would refer to as an LRTI. Um, our, my personal preference is to use an FCR, although I know there are a lot of ways to suspend the thumb out um, using uh, local tendons. 
Um, and then the other option that we've been using a lot more, and we're actually, you know, you're leading a trial on, is that um, suture tape to keep the thumb out. Yeah. And so that's just, so the big picture was take out the bone, the arthritic bone, and then do something, we think, to stabilize what's left. There's and some suggestion. a little bit about, you know, the other options, right? Like an arthrodesis. I mean, do you talk yep. a, lot, a lot about that with patients or? Yeah, absolutely. Um, I, we in the United States and certainly we in St. Louis have not been big fans of taking out the bone and not doing much, you know, mm -hmm. putting a pen in temporarily. We don't, we haven't found that to be successful. So take out the bone and one way or another, we support the thumb, the rest of the thumb, whether that's a tendon, as you said, or some type of uh, um, suture tape, either way. The other option, which I think I like more than most is a fusion where we take that arthritic joint and we make the bone past it and the bone closer to the wrist into one bone. So we use a plate and screws, put them together and encourage those bones to heal together, thereby eliminating the joint and eliminating the pain. The because criticism, the bones were rubbing on each other before causing pain. Exactly. So and so, yeah, the criticism is, can you always get it to heal? And that's fair criticism. And is it the right option for every patient? The answer is probably not. I like that in the young laborer population that has premature arthritis. You know, I, I think that um, there are some ways in which we can set patients up for success in terms of talking about expectations. Um, do, what do you tell patients they should expect? Um, and how do you incorporate, you know, any sort of discussion from the patients ahead of time saying, you know, these are the activities that I do. Can you get me there? You know, my hope with every surgery is that I get a patient back to doing anything and everything they want. You know, we in orthopedics and we in hand surgery, that's what we're about, getting patients back to the activities they want to do. The reality is the classic procedure, that LRTI you mentioned, where you take out the bone and use a tendon to support the thumb, is a really good surgery. It's the gold standard. It's a really good surgery. The negative is it can take four to six months to get there. Four to six months before you feel comfortable doing everything. The alleged benefit of the newer operation with suture tape is, can you get there six weeks or eight weeks, which is a dramatic difference. And yeah. so, yeah, that's my discussion. Um, the four to six months thing is, is, that's tough for some patients to swallow, but you, I mean, you have to tell them that ahead of time. Otherwise they are just going to be unhappy. And they thought that pain was going to be better right away. And they were going to get back to doing everything right away. Cause all you did was take out a bone. Um, and, you know, I think perhaps it's, you know, our confidence in the rehab protocols and what we're allowing patients to do sooner may unlock, you know, that ability to cut that time down. But, you know, that's one of the harder things when you're counseling patients about this before surgery is looking them in the eye and saying, look, you're going to be down for about four to six months. Yeah. And one of the things as we wrap up that I tell patients is, you know, there are procedures I really like to do because they're so reliable and they just provide a reliably good outcome. That doesn't mean every patient is as good as they want to be or as good as we want them to be. Uh, but this is one of those procedures. This so procedure your, helps. Huh? What if your family, what if one of your family members was going to have an LRTI? Um, what would you say to them? Like, you should ask your doctor this. I would have them, first of all, I want the doctor to do whatever procedure he or she is most comfortable doing and has had the best results. Uh, also think it's incredibly important that the patient and the doctor gel, right? I mean, you have to, don't go to a doctor who's a jerk and doesn't give you the time and doesn't answer your questions. While they may be technically excellent, I think that relationship matters. And having, being able to have a discussion with the surgeon really matter. So get along with your surgeon, understand their preference. And just because you may have heard some other procedure works, if the doctor is com confident, comfortable, has a good reputation, uh, those things all matter. I mean, how, how do we really judge patient outcomes? It's still hard in 2020. It's still really hard to know and compare one surgeon to the next, but reputations develop for a reason. You know, it's um, one of the studies that we're doing right now is an interview study with patients who have had thumb surgery, um, like, like we're discussing. And it sounds silly, but I guess we're not as good as we, we should be at saying, hey, you're having surgery on your dominant hand. You are going to have to learn how to do things with your other hand. And, and it sounds so simple, um, but clearly we're not addressing it in the way that we should. Um, so I, I think probably I'm going to, based on... Um, the results of that study, which are still ongoing, you know, which is still ongoing. I'm going to talk to patients a little bit more about what exactly to expect in terms of function very early on. Um, and a lot of times our hand therapy colleagues will do that with them 
Um, but I think that it is helpful to have it come from the surgeon. I think you're right. I love this line of research you're pursuing, this so-called qualitative research, where it involves talking to patients instead of just collecting data. Um, it's, it's new to us, uh, <laughs> but you're leading the way, and I think it's great stuff, and I think it's going to help patient care ultimately. Yeah, no, I think it's a different way of approaching research. I've enjoyed it because I learn things from every interview. I mean, a lot of these patients are my patients, you know, when we're doing these qualitative studies with the nerve injury patients. And I'm humbled every time with what I didn't know. And, and I think it's made me better. And I think that um, surgeons are always looking for ways to get better, either technically or in talking to patients. So. Absolutely. Well, listen, I, I feel like I've talked to your son the whole, the whole conversation. Um, so that's been fun. Tell him I said, tell Rafi I said hi. Yeah, um, you know, they're, they're getting rambunctious. So that was, probably means that we're out of time. <laughs> we are out of time. This was fun as usual. And hopefully, uh, um, hopefully the Facebook Live group uh, found it interesting as well. All right. Fantastic. All right. Thanks all. Thank you. Hopefully that was uh, reasonable.